Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. I have a bit of a work experience in Africa and a bit of that hopefully will help in today's podcast discussions. Um, and I've tried to understand through my time how diverse, is beautiful and different the challenges in each region is. And hopefully that can lead to more uh, engaging discussion today. Yeah, and I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a background in research in international relations. And we are from Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Yeah, Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a world that is not just sustainable, but one that thrives. Uh, before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia and, and First Nations people across the world. Um, so today we're talking about survivability in the African context uh, with a special focus on how this affects uh, survivability in Africa as an overall continent and then hopefully future conversations on more environmental and mental health uh, issues. We would like to introduce today's guest. Emmanuel is a Ghanaian national who has lived and in Ghana, Togo and Nigeria in West Africa. He has a Bachelor of Business Administration and Master's in ICT Education. He is passionate about sustainability and believes that education can be a great way of empowering communities and fostering positive change. Emmanuel's combination of academic expertise, cultural awareness and his dedication to leveraging education for community empowerment reflects a broader vision for a more inclusive and sustainable future in West Africa and beyond. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to an uh, unexpected discussion. Welcome, Emmanuel. So today's uh, topic is we're talking about thrivability, but in an African context, and I understand it's a very broad area to speak about. Um, Africa is a continent continent of 54 countries with extremely different uh, cultural uh, languages and contexts in each of these countries. But there is a, an African identity in general that, that is spoken about. And we're hoping that with your lived experience, we can go in a little more depth about uh, what it means to be thrivable. Um, so maybe that's my first question. What? How do we define thrivability uh, in general and then maybe specifically in African contexts? Thrivability, you now, from um, first of all, should mean creating a world that is uh, better for every single uh, living entity that is in it. First of all, we being a superior species, obviously, should be better for us, uh, you know. But at the same time, we should consider all the uh, living creatures in the ecosystem that we live in, being in planet animals, and more so to consider the future generation that will live uh, beyond us. So that, that is what travelability should mean for uh, each and every one of us. But obviously that is not the same because people may interpret what uh, sustainable is for them because of certain issues, certain beliefs, certain cultural values that they may hold dear to themselves. From an African point of view, travelability would mean the same all things being equal, but Unfortunately, that is not because if you ask a name on the street, what does it mean for you in terms of conserving the world that we currently live in so that your children have a better place uh, to live in you know, when, when they when they come forward or when they grow? Surprisingly, most folks would think would say they would agree, but currently, if they are not able to uh, survive beyond themselves, then there is no chance for their children because uh, they are not self-sustainable, to put it in a better phrase, right? Uh, because of issues that they have having. Uh, obviously, they would like to uh, keep the world a better place, but if they themselves are not sustainable, then the, it is very hard for them to think of the broader picture. This is what charity sadly means for uh, most Africans. Not all of us, uh, but well. The unfortunate few, uh, uh, part, we, yeah, and it's very hard to think of it in a broader picture. Most people think of it in terms of their personal survival uh, in the current situation that they have. 
just like you said, it's every person, if you ask them, would probably think of just their current situation. I think it's also true maybe at, uh, at some of the governmental levels when as an overall economy, you're in a very difficult position. You are looking at how to uplift uh, the situation right now for everybody around and not necessarily, I guess, the long-term vision. Um, so yeah, that does make the context, I think, slightly different. Yeah, and I think it, it's, uh, as uh, Emmanuel was indicating, there are obviously different uh, cultural and uh, economic factors in place. And as he alluded to, obviously, there are different uh, drawbacks. It would be interesting to know what you find, Emmanuel, are those uh, specific uh, drawbacks. But um, yeah, one thing, I, which is obviously the case is, I think, uh, talking about thrivability, um, obviously, things like mental well-being and community well-being, as well as uh, ecosystem uh, uh, preservation are, are key areas. And I'm aware of um, one psychiatrist, uh, prominent psychiatrist, I think, based in the US had mentioned that on an uh, epistemological level, there is a difference in approaches to understanding uh, uh, well-being uh, between the global south and the global north that um, in within the global north everything and developed you know wealthy countries that there's been a history of everything being very individualistic and perhaps that's somehow uh, supported by the the greater say wealth and historical uh, context there but within the global south and many developing developing countries of which many african nations are a part of there has been a different approach which has uh, considered other factors like uh, things like colonial uh, histories, and, but also thing and, and some of the factors that have influenced um, uh, the, the structures of societies, but also things like uh, community as a focus as well uh, for generating well-being. So I would be interested uh, throughout this yeah, podcast to hear more about um, your views on, on that, on the influences of culture and these different approaches and uh, community approaches to uh, uh, thrivability, both in the context of uh, ecosystems, but also uh, mental and community well-being. First of all, I'd like to take the very simple one. Uh, let's I want to start from mental well-being. You know, it is uh, a couple of years ago when I became uh, exposed to the idea of mental well-being. It was funny for me because Saturday that didn't exist in our books. It still does not exist here. Even with everything that I've been through and I know as at this point, I do not know of any single psychologist to kind of call and then reach out to to talk about uh, depression or stress or anxiety, anything that is mental world being focused. It does not exist here. Psychology is not an area in Africa here. Uh, even, for the, even among the educated. Why? Because of the culture. People do not really put emphasis on what is going on in their minds, and you know? unfortunately, it's very sad. But the entire culture told that is look, you have more pending uh, astronomically huge issues to worry about than to think of how you are feeling. If you are hungry and then you are depressed, which one is really uh, uh, imperative for you to deal with right now? So no matter how you're feeling, you put on your coat, uh, you get out there, and then I uh, make something of yourself. You know. That is it. That is how it is for people. So this discussion is completely absent uh, for most folk, uh, unfortunately, on the mental well being aspect. On the other side, the culture, uh, the African indigenous culture is, you know, is one that tests our sustainability. And, you know, if you consider uh, uh, centuries before uh, Europeans first arrived on the continent, the co the society is very sustainable. It is very inclusive of every single tribe in it, uh, in terms of to even the little worm that is under 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 underneath the soil. Uh, it still is on the on a smaller scale now because we have a kind of industrialized or assimilated the industrialization of uh, the developed cultures, but uh, it is on a very small scale now. People do think of one 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 another, you know. Uh, we have community sense of uh, well-being. You know, we kind of do things together. Uh, think of the society as a whole, even in agriculture, in and in, in community get-togethers. But uh, to the scale where uh, you kind of think of it as conserving resources, this is where we are not uh, lacking behind severely nowadays because. Uh, things that people wouldn't resort to centuries ago, they have no option to do now. Uh, 
and then the from the macro uh, economic point of view, uh, there was no public poverty centuries ago before European arrived here. In Africa, everybody was their own uh, person. Uh, we didn't have government. There was nothing like institutions or societal hierarchy, at least not in the context that we have currently. But in the in the modern era where we have government, sadly our uh, institutions of government have not been one that has been very beneficial to EG at the can of themselves because of uh, poor management, lack of accountability, and then uh, the vicious poverty cycle that has been uh, facilitated by colonial and post-colonial uh, uh, trade and uh, views that, that still persists today, making it impossible to, you know, cater for uh, the indigenous local populations themselves. Because I simply put it this way, for me now, I like to speak out to people to encourage them to do good for the broader picture. But it is very hard looking into the eyes of a father that has four hungry children and then uh, telling him to, look, do not uh, overhunt. We shouldn't hunt in this uh, preserved forest because these animals play a vital role in our biodiversity. You know, it's very hard to tell him, especially when that is a source of food. You know, this is a very classic paradox that I, use, I usually cite because that is a source of food uh, that he can afford you know, at the moment. And so it's very hard for you, for you to get him to think about the broader picture to say, do not hunt this endangered species because uh, they help make the water better place. He said, I, I will, it's very hard for him to, get, uh, to care about that because he's thinking of what he's going to eat, feed himself now and feed his children now. You know, most most of these folks are not being greedy. They just want to live to see the next day. That That is the that is the issue there. And so it will begin from uh, the government uh, to take the right steps towards the right, uh, making the economy a better place, providing opportunities, and then including all aspects and then uh, uh, all people into the uh, conversation about sustainability and taking off one another in making the world a better place. Yeah. And I think even if we have to look at it as, like you said, the governmental and institutional level of uh, bringing in economic progress, uh, isn't there some part of it still uh, tied to the colonial history? I mean, Africa has such a diverse set of countries having been occupied by different colonial powers, different languages, different economic processes, different resource extraction mechanisms. And some of these still continue to today in, in spite of having independent countries. Uh, isn't there still some kind of reliance between the pre-colonial powers and today in the business context? There is, yep. There really is. In fact, the country itself was built on uh, neo-colonial uh, agreements that sought to exploit the country, uh, even though uh, colonial powers had left the country. Think of it this way. Our first president um, made a uh, powerful speech. He, said, he says, I'm just uh, rephrasing here, that uh, neo-colonialism is a new colonial power because we be wary of the deals that they make, you can't produce yourself, then you can't be yourself, you know. Uh, if everything that you're going to do in this country is dictated by what someone has to tell you, and then it's very hard for you to move around it because you are faced with sanctions. And then coupled with that, if you get leaders who want to put their feet, uh, their feet on the ground and say, hey, no, I will put this in the right direction for my own self, for my own people. Then they are threatened with uh, alienization by foreign powers. You will be branded as an authoritarian uh, leader, you know, uh, and then uh, you will be faced with sanctions. You can't deal with the international countries anymore. So that is the issue that we have. Uh, honestly, I believe that uh, the uh, leaders here is not their fault. Most of them would want to do things in the right direction. You risk uh, being a session or uh, treated as a as a hostile nation or as a hostile leader. But it's what people do not want to uh, do as a country. And very hard for me to listen to foreign articles, foreign interviews, listen uh, 
uh, outside the product that come in Kuma as a, as a authoritarian leader because of his policy that he had like new colonial uh, structures. Uh, as of now, some people in this country still think that uh, those assertions are true. But the new colonial structure that I place, even if you get funding from uh, 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 loans from the IMF or the World Bank, they kind of have to take which areas you can invest resources into. What you can do, what you can do with the funds, and uh, what you can invest in, which essentially traps these funds back into the uh, uh, the country that you are borrowing from. The same as the dealings that we recently have started with China, right? China has been the uh, go-to place for us to borrow, and then when you borrow this money, you have to use it in. You have to bring in Chinese workers to come and then work on your project pay them the salaries. Very and then we only have only a few Ghanaians or a little part of the revenue staying in the country. Of course it necessarily moves outside uh, uh, the, the the funders country to be able to do what uh, you are doing in your country. And then you are left with this huge no tax on your own people to be able to pay the loan. And then if you want another loan, you have to show that you will pay back leveraging more taxes on the people and on the taxes, the taxes alone are what is crippling the economy because with huge taxes, businesses cannot take off. With huge taxes, the working class cannot, uh, cannot, can barely survive the economy. So they have no means of engaging in entrepreneurial uh, 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 ventures or, and then the basis for establishing or stabilizing the economy is increased entrepreneurial activity. People can't go into farming. Can produce our own food, we cannot do things that bring the most out of the resources that we are receiving outside because of the taxes and then the need to demonstrate that can pay back out. It is a vicious cycle that keeps persisting, even up to now, uh, with a smiling face at the cover up for uh, uh, relief or uh, benefit, benefit to Africa. But it really isn't. Uh, beneficial on any level up. Yeah, just on that note too, uh, yeah, Emmanuel, you mentioned um, institutions like the, the IMF and uh, World Bank and, and the different uh, loans that were given and the, the debt repayments there, which is obviously something um, which has been uh, historically crippling many African countries. And also too, it's interesting when you talk about the uh, neo-colonialism, but also the legacy of, of colonialism itself. Um, and the impact that that has had. I've, I've read a, there's been a couple of uh, studies that have uh, looked into the ways in which post-colonial uh, setups did uh, severely impact uh, many, uh, a few African countries. For instance, when um, there was, I think in both uh, Portuguese, Spanish, French and uh, Belgian colonies, as well as British colonies, uh, throughout the first half of the 20th century, there were things like... Um, uh, coercive uh, labor. There was uh, for some countries that um, they had you know, forced labor, which is essentially slavery, and the extraction of resources. But uh, where, during the uh, mid twentieth century, when um, there was a let's say you know the breakdown of colonialism, uh, I'm aware that for some for for areas of francophone uh, Africa, there were some post colonial um, arrangements in place, uh, trade arrangements, um, sort of uh, agreements in place um, by the newly independent uh, governments and, uh, in this case, our previous colonial power, uh, in which uh, things like um, our resources and the ability to trade with whoever uh, they, they, uh, the country would, would like to trade with was, was not an option that, that, that these resources had to go to the previous colonial power, which I think you alluded to in another context. But um, it's interesting yeah, the extent to which there was a there was a study looking at the extent to which uh, like colonial tax even had an impact on the sovereignty of many uh, African nations within uh, different regions. Um, there was just another study quite recently looking at uh, both Anglophone and uh, Francophone Africa, obviously French and British uh, colonies, and just saying how the despite the presence, the pervasive presence of many. Uh, international uh, financial institutions to assist with African uh, sovereignty and, and to assist in this regard, uh, there's significant uh, drawbacks 
despite this because of the stranglehold on on that within uh, the French context. It's quite a direct um, uh, de- uh, post-colonial arrangement uh, within the uh, Anglophone or British and American. It's more through uh, other financial institutions, but nonetheless, it has a obviously a very restrictive impact on uh, on trading capacity and on on resource use. And obviously, there are you know probably more murky areas of of discussion too when it comes to the political interferences of, of different countries, uh, different previous colonial powers, but. Obviously, these factors, as you uh, alluded to, must have a severe impact on uh, African sovereignty, but also you know, of many different uh, African nations, but also their economic potential. And as a consequence, as we uh, began the, the uh, episode with uh, you know, the, the well-being and thrivability of people within Africa, both in an ecosystem uh, context and uh, you know, protecting you know, uh, the natural world, but also the obvious as a, as a consequence of that the uh, social implications and the, the the economic factors as you were, as you had discussed about you know poverty and people trying to live in a subsistence uh, way in a sustainable way yet um, their resources are and uh, financial capacity has uh, been interfered with to such an extent that that obviously makes that um, extremely crippled in many ways yeah and I think just thinking about how to look at if we just look at economic uh, issues and how it impacts day-to-day life. Uh, what kind of solutions do do we think um, can take it? I know a lot of these are very macro level uh, issues that that we just discussed. But I, I remember, I mean, when I was in Senegal for a brief period and there was explorations and discoveries of there was probably oil in somewhere off the coast and people were really hoping, you know, if we spoke to some of the locals, they would say, I hope they don't find it because we will get into all of the problems that comes with the resource-rich nation. Um, as again, there are parts of the world where they're resource-rich and they really grow economically well and get more independence. But most in an African context, the more resource they have, the more difficult the country's situation becomes and more murky, as you said, you know, the political interference becomes. So what, what do we think are some of the you know solutions from a day-to-day person's perspective? But also maybe broadly that we can we can look into. First of all, I would like to say pray to God to let all Africa's resources vanish, you know, currently because of the resource cut. Think of what is happening to uh, the DRC current. You have war now funded by different factions, you know, so that so long as the war continues, they can keep uh, rapidly exploiting the resources that these countries have has. So. The war is a cover up while other countries are planning their resources. Right. Recently, uh, Russian, Russian mercenaries have been seen and we have had a pretense of solving the war, but really it is just a cover up to get solutions to this issue. I would say, first of all, uh, the entire solutions should be one that should be focused on uh, removing macro uh, macroeconomic deficiencies in our economy because. So long as the poverty persists, you have little to no chance at uh, improving the situation on, on the uh, average individual uh, 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 point of view. Because uh, you can't, you, you really won't be able to get around it. But it will mean individuals tie the knees on their own neck to forego their current hardship. You think of the broader picture. Uh, the government, uh, and it is very hard. Uh, because uh, as long as there are deals that favor Western countries, the war persists in uh, uh, taking advantage of these deals, which do not necessarily contribute to developing other countries themselves. Maybe it will, someone, want, someone might say, let's hold our own leaders accountable for their actions. Let's force them to make better deals. Um, why do we keep electing new officials? over the last two or three decades that keep making bills that are for their own interests at the expense of our world. Maybe that's a starting point. But then again, most people do not have, uh, you have literacy rates of uh, uh, just a little bit over 50% even as of now. And the politician comes and is speaking in. So most of the policies are not understood by the Lima. So they can't really rely on the manifestos to vote. Then again, we are presented with uh, 
two or three new days to choose from, and it's a cycle around the same path. So we really do not have option as to that. If you need to double, it's not a They can't the power, and then they continue what they are. But uh, the corruption and then the malappropriation of funds is worse on the recurring basis uh, after the next, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, parliament. If today is bad, the next uh, pal- uh, the next uh, caucus that comes to power will be worse than the current one that we have. So they should just keep constant there. And then, uh, as of now, I have no idea how to uh, get our leaders to take the rights. I do not like who is in power now. Neither do I like his counterpart. Uh, they are all full of experience. Uh, uh, but if we could get our leaders to take the right decision towards making uh, the country a better which would mean probably becoming an Indian nation in the eyes of the colonial powers. They would not let uh, what they are better of or their bowl of uh, their plate of food be under their, uh, their mouths that is have to put some top of this uh, It's up to people themselves uphold this stuff towards making the their own life. I strongly believe that poverty alleviation is the first step and then probably contributes ninety percent of the solution because it is only then can we uh, move outside our own interest or the end of the and take the think of the world uh, on a global uh, global scale, think of the world uh, in terms of the future. First, it's easy for us to forego the little that we do not have, but very hard to forego the little that we have in the broader picture. Yeah, right. yeah, and I think just to add, there's also a need, I guess, in, in these cases for the new colonial countries whose businesses operate in different manners to also reflect and look into their policies. Because while we are looking at the leadership improvements from day to day folks, there's also a need for a much larger uh, involvement of, of, I think, the global population because they are all beneficiaries of the resources that we do get from um, Africa. Mike, is there something you want to add? Yeah, no, I, I agree just with that as well as both as Emmanuel said about um, things obviously needing to change within Africa itself. But yeah, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, I think yeah, if, if the many of the previous or near colonial powers, if there's a bit of a an attitude change, I think that's a good start. I think there's a lot of denial of the impact of of um, Western countries and p- particularly previous colonial powers on the developing world. There's a lot of quite deliberate denial, and I think um, when that that's more above board and and uh, the sort of exploitation and let's say misconduct is more exposed and more heavily understood, I think that might have an impact on international policy. So, yeah, I think uh, that's probably a good start as well. If we could get uh, uh, a lot of feet, uh, a lot of, uh, how do you call it, backlash from people over the or in the world developed country who are primary beneficial, uh, beneficial results, is uh, expectation in Africa country to get more people to cause their own leaders their own institution, calm down the uh, uh, cycle, uh, poverty cycle, though, that could definitely be a bit of help in the fight. There's little that African can do in terms of forcing the new about back off, right? Uh, we'll probably have to rely on uh, Western cultures and the Yep. I think also from day to day people, it's important to look at your leaders. And- seeing if you have the opportunity to elect them, how do you kind of ensure make the best choices? Um, okay, thank you so much. We are pretty short on time. Um, I know there's a lot more we could get into on this topic. Uh, we would like to probably continue this conversation in manual, maybe going more deeper into specific areas in the future uh, around maybe well-being, could be around environmental specifically. But thank you so much for joining us uh, and being a part of this discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Keep on thriving. <laughs>